Charles. I'm Linda Quinlan. I'm Keith Gosland. Today is Tuesday, March 27th. We've got lots of headlines, lots of fun for you. But first, Zach. He's Happy 33. Birthday. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday, Zach. <laughs> On to you. <laughs> <laughs> International headlines. Zach's birthday. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I just have to say, Zach is a wonderful colleague and friend. He's to be commended for all his work. International headlines. Black lesbian councilwoman gunned down in Rio and then becomes a global symbol. Kenya court ends forced anal exams. Good news from Australia. Pakistan Senate passes a bill protecting rights of transgender people. Beijing Festival pulls the award-winning gay film Call Me By Your Name amid content squeeze. These stories I probably won't get to. Historic victory for trans people in Sweden. The Swedish parliament decides on compensation for forced sterilizations, the first country in the world to do that. Gay wedding ban sparks cruise boycott call. Guess where? what this is about? Yes, Bermuda and Carnival Cruise, etc. And finally, uh, transgender woman Naomi Hersey murdered in a London hotel room. And I'd like to show a picture of her. Very sad. She was 38. A uh, man and a teenage girl have been detained. Uh, she was stabbed to death. Mm. So. <clears throat> For my headlines, at least some of them, the HRC Human Rights Committee endorses Nelson Arojo of Nevada as Secretary of State. Uh, Lita Waite opens lesbian, open lesbian actor, director and writer, is on the cover of Vanity Fair. She also has a series on Netflix called Master of None. Betsy DeVos is in danger is a danger to transgender. <laughs> I know, I was hoping. Children, as she refuses to enforce the law and investigate Title IX complaints, Louisiana State Supreme Court rejects bid to restore in, uh, employment protections for LGBTQ state workers. Table tennis lesbian Kelly Sibley has a fairy tale wedding. George Takai to appear at the American Documentary Film Festival in Palm Springs, he will be presented with the festival's human, human, hum, humanitarian, humanitarian, humanitarian. Thank you. There we go. Humanitarian award. Senator Tony Atkins becomes first woman and the first LBGT person to lead the California Senate. And in the larger stories, uh, does it does it matter that a gay man helped Trump backers exploit Facebook data? San Francisco Airport is set to rename a terminal for Harvey Milk. High school student organizes first gay pride celebration in Mike Pence's hometown. LBGT Pride Parade in Starksville, Mississippi. The appointment of Ma Mike Pompeo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> a boy in Iowa was told he couldn't partace participate in the American Legion Boys State. Now the religious right is targeting the Girl Scouts. Man killed after angry driver plows into crowd of people outside LGBTQ nightclub in Houston. And healthcare, religious referrals, or refusals endanger millions. So. You two are just so cheery. I know. I, <laughs> oh, I know. <laughs> so I want to talk about our youth and. That's cheery. As, and it's positive stuff. And I know that you will not be surprised that I, I might want to talk a little bit about legislation. <laughs> and, and I want to note that as we're here taping it, that our House of Representatives is debating one of the firearm bills for which I believe there were 12 amendments. They've been on the floor since 10 o'clock this morning, and it's 5.30 now, and they're not done. So several notices, one starting Monday, April 9th and running through Friday, April 13th is an exhibit at the UVM Interfaith Center, Pink Triangle and the Holocaust, 
And this is talking about the lives and experiences of LGBTQ people during the Holocaust. And there is a reception that's being held on Tuesday the 10th from 11.30 to 1.30 p.m. Kosher food is being served. <laughs> the right. other is be looking for someone who might be formally announcing that they're a gubernatorial candidate on April 8th, which is a Sunday. I'm told the event is happening in Morrisville. Uh -huh. So if you're in Morrisville, be looking for a large crowd of people. All right. And? All right. Let's go to Rio uh, for this sad story about Marielle Franco. Uh, I have a picture so of her to show you. Um, before stepping into her Chevrolet last Wednesday, she had just done her best. She, one of her skills was firing up a room. Let's do this, the 38-year-old politician with the cascading afro had said as she wrapped up a speech at Rio's House of Black Women calling for black empowerment. Brazil needed it, she said. Across this troubled metropolis, police brutality and extra, extrajudicial killings were, rage, were ravaging the favelas. Elected last year as the only black woman on Rio's 51-member city council, she had gone after those responsible while reframing the debate in an uncomfortable new way. In a society that has long seen itself as post-racial, Franco argued the slaughter was not just a war on the poor, it was also a war on blacks. 30 minutes after the gathering, two vehicles approached her white Chevy, then she was shot by nine police issue bullets, including four shots to the head. But if the point had been to silence this fast rising black lesbian politician who had taken on corrupt police officers, uh, Franco's apparent assassination had done just the opposite. In the days since, Latin America's largest nation has watched in awe as a figure once little known outside Rio has been transformed into a global symbol of rac racial oppression. She's been honored on the floor of the European Parliament. Crowds have protested her killing and celebrated her life on the streets of New York, London, Paris, Munich, Stockholm and Lisbon. A vigil, vigil was held for her in Madrid today. Uh, Mariella is here, has garnered millions of mentions on Twitter and Facebook, that's a hashtag. From Berlin to Miami to Montreal, mourners who never heard of Franco before last week are borrowing a line from the Black, Black Lives Matter movement, say her name. Um, thousands in Rio have protested her assassination, and I have a picture of one of those marches. At least 100, police are nervous. At least 120 officers were killed in 2017, including many in confrontations with drug traffickers. But last year, 1,124 people died at the hands of police, the highest number in a decade. In recent years, nearly 80% of those killed by police were black or mixed race. White male politicians in Rio have also uh, sought to bring corrupt police officers to justice, but Franco was targeted, her backers insist, because taking the life of a black woman is less risky in Brazil, especially in a state where only one in 10 homicide cases results in a conviction. As a black left-wing lesbian, Franco represented an intersection of movements that are coalescing as a result of her slaying. Tens of thousands of Brazilians of every color have taken to the streets in the aftermath of her death. But some hope that the killing will mark a turning point for black activism, a concept that has struggled to take off in Brazil. Uh, a black woman was speaking out and calling for rights, and she was killed because she could be, said Rubia Augusta Gomez, a 34-year-old Afro-Brazilian dancer who on Sunday joined thousands at the march. Um, in Franco was born in a violence-ridden favela of Mare, where she was born and raised 
some more stickers at this march in that particular locale, militancy in the name of Mariela. Racism in Brazil has a complex history. Uh, the country imported four million slaves, more than 10 times the number brought to the United States. In the U.S., as we know, the intermingling of races was discouraged. But in Brazil, where Portuguese settlers were outnumbered by their slaves, it was endorsed as a way to whiten the population. Miscegenation soon became a cornerstone of national identity, with 53% of Brazilians now seeing themselves fluidly as mixed race. Every day, 112 blacks of mixed race Brazilians are killed, according to a Brazilian think tank. They make up 53% of the national population, as I just said, but 71% of all homicides. After her childhood in Marais, the favela I just spoke of, she took night classes to, turn, to earn her high school diploma. She gained a full scholarship to the Fontifical Catholic University of Rio, where she was one of two black women studying sociology. After a close friend was killed by a stray bullet during a shootout between police and drug traffickers in 2006, she muscled her way into Rio's political scene. Uh, a sphere dominated by white men, despite the city's ethnic diversity. She was the only black woman on Rio City Council in a country where there are no black cabinet members. In 2008, Franco was part of its, an investigative committee looking into Rio's militias made up of former policemen and private security offers that routinely extorted residents for access to a gas, cable, TV, and transportation line. The committee found that 118 militias were operating in the city. It indicted 226 people, including 67 police officers. Franco was also a fierce critic of Rio's 41st military police battalion, known as the Death Brigade, for the killing and shooting of black youth, and she routinely publicized those killings. The day before her death, she mourned the loss of Mateus Melo, a young black favela resident who was shot while coming out of a church with his girlfriend, just the latest victim of the multi-front conflict among drug traffickers, militia, and police in Rio, uh, a state that has left casualties on all sides. How many more people need to die before this war ends? Franco tweeted. She is survived by her 19-year-old daughter and her, par her lesbian partner of many years. Very oh, sad. That is a very sad story. Um, isn't, the, isn't Brazil where they have all the uh, transgender murders, too? There are transgender murders, <clears throat> and conversely, there have been new laws passed in favor of transgender rights. But yes, it, I think it has it's the highest. It's still high. very high, isn't it? Yes. It's the highest, I think. Yes. OK. I have another story, or well, do you want to? We have to move on now. OK. <laughs> we know who's in charge. Yes. <laughs> um, one of our favorite people, Ben Carson, says that, what? <laughs> <laughs> says that trans people in homeless shelters are not welcome because they make <laughs> other people feel nervous. So they're not welcome in homeless shelters anymore. Got to love it. <laughs> Will and Grace will be back for another season, for those people who are Will and Grace fans. Philadelphia stops money going to Catholic adoption agencies because they discriminate against LGBTQ people. That's good news. The book Fire and Fury suggests that Trump's brother was gay. The health department info on lesbian and bi women's health issues has been removed. Mm -hmm. New York Catholic Archbishop opposes a bill that makes it easier for abuse victims to sue. Mm -hmm. Really? Yes. Um, I wonder what his concern might be. <laughs> I don't I, know. I, I couldn't I imagine. imagine. I love a familiar story. <laughs> <laughs> Proposition in Anchorage, Alaska. Proposition 1 mandates that trans people I in thought you were still talking about the bishop. <laughs> <laughs> he was propositioning. Yeah, really. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, it does kind of go together. <laughs> um, and municipal buildings must use their um, bathroom 
of birth gender. So that's Says in, who? That's in Anchorage in oh, the okay. municipal okay. buildings in okay. Alaska. <coughs> and cult star Jillian Mason, and I didn't know who she was. I still don't know. I know. Anyway, she <laughs> she's a cult person on um, YouTube. Anyway, She's very popular, and she says that the latest cure for being gay is fermented cabbage. Juice. Oh, I read that. <laughs> fermented cabbage? Juice. Yes. Oh, yeah. Cabbage juice. It <coughs> yeah. makes you poop. Yeah, it makes you poop, and so then you're not homosexual anymore. I'm not How going there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and does it matter that a gay man helped Trump backers exploit Facebook data? Well, I say it does, but... I say it doesn't. Michelangelo Christopher Riley finally came forward to explain how his as a data scientist, he helped create Steve Bannon's psychological warfare and helped bring Trump into the White House. Cambridge Analytica. Yep. Well, maybe I'll take back my defense of him. Though his whistleblowing may not totally exonerate him, it's a good thing that he came forward and told us about Facebook data being used to help Trump win the election. He was so he gets a half star. He was testifying before the House of Commons today Oh, and said that the estimate of 50 million Facebook yeah, at least. accounts, yep. no, 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 he said that is dramatically underestimating. Huh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm. Well, that wouldn't surprise me. San Francisco Airport is set to rename a terminal for Harvey Milk. The honor follows the U.S. Navy naming a boat after him in 2016. Javi Milk, as many of us know, was a gay rights activist in San Francisco in the 70s and is a hero to many. Mm -hmm. He was the first openly gay man to be elected to public office in the U.S. and he was murdered in 1978. High school student organizes first gay pride celebration in Mike Pence's hometown of Columbus, Ohio. The 18-year-old is planning a parade for April 14th as part of a high school project. And he says he's organizing a Columbus Pride Parade because he feels it's important for members of the LGBT community to know that Columbus is a wel welcoming and diverse community. Aaron Bailey, a senior at Columbus Signature Academy, New Tech, says, even though Mike Pence is openly anti-gay, that doesn't mean all of us in his hometown are. So good for you, Erin Bailey, and uh, I hope uh, she does a good job and a lot of people turn out. And if you're listening in Columbus, <laughs> <laughs> please head on the, down. Head on down. <laughs> so on to you. So latest update. They're still debating, and they've just taken a recess to discuss another amendment ah. so whoops there so our youth and at this point zach is going to show you a series of photographs from saturday's march for saturday the 24th march for our lives both here in montpelier and in washington dc and from having participated at the march here in montpelier and then going home and watching the ongoing coverage of the March in Washington, D.C. Let me tell you about our youth. One of the commentators stated that we talk a lot about intersectionality and what it means and what it should look like. Their comment was, these kids didn't need that. They were living it. Our youth, both here in Montpelier and the youth at Washington, D.C., it was only the youth that spoke. And it was from every aspect of our community and every aspect of people who had experienced and survived gun violence. And Martin the Luther King's granddaughter daughter oh was God. adorable. Oh. And the young woman of color who was 11 years old who stood up and said, everyone says that there is an adult behind me telling me what to say. Mm -hmm. No. I mean... And, and, and I will tell you that the March on Washington, what I was totally struck by, and even the commentator didn't have a dry eye. Last speaker, 
Emma Gonzalez, young Latina woman. She started talking of all the 17 people who didn't survive Parkland and saying such as Linda will never dance in the hallway again. Oh, that was so beautiful. And will mm -hmm. never read poetry again. And then she did something that is absolutely not done at rallies. She stood silent for six minutes and 20 seconds, the amount of time that the assailant fired on them in the oh. high school. And it was staggering. <clears throat> yeah. It really. So, but our youth here in Vermont, on March 15th, they had an LGBTQ leadership day at the State House. They met legislators. They spent time with the governor. And the governor's not going to forget it. They also had a conversation with a panel of out lesbian, gay, self-identified legislators. Throughout the day, they first met with Representative Kaya Morris, who is the person who has introduced uh, the ethnic studies bill that I'll talk about with the legislative update. And she clearly looked at them and said, find and use your voices. And they heard it. And then the governor came in for half an hour. They were direct. They were articulate. Oh. They held the governor's feet to the fire. They asked him about gender-neutral bathrooms being available in all schools. Why is passage of the gender-neutral bathroom bill taking so long? With a high suicide rate among LGBT youth, where is Vermont's commitment to provide mental health services specifically to LGBTQ youth? They talked about the proposal for the new prison. Ah. Where is your commitment to, in particular, protecting the rights of the incarcerated transgender community that is incarcerated in Vermont at a higher percentage than the population at large, as are communities of color. And then a lot about pronoun use. And uh -huh. what are you going to do to ensure that teachers really have training and that they had received most of their information about being LGBTQ in their healthcare curriculums? which if the school offered it was being taught by a cisgendered white heterosexual instructor who had had no formal training on our issues and why should they rely on the internet to get their education and as has been reported in some of the mainstream press who I'm not sure how they knew it was happening and how they got invited reported that the governor really didn't have answers. He had no specific he couldn't proposal. couldn't answer any of these. No. no? He, okay. had, he had no specific proposal that he could come back and say, this is what we're doing to develop mental health services. This is what we're doing to ensure that educators in our school have training on these issues and that there's some degree of competency. I think that somebody <coughs> might be reminding him Who of what I can't imagine. <laughs> But it's someone who dresses lovely. <laughs> and has a black tie? Exactly. Uh -huh. <laughs> and the youth also met with Brenda Churchill and myself as, as the LGBTQIA liaisons. And we heard what they said. We repeated it back to them, mm -hmm. saying, this is the issue I heard you state. This is, the langu this is how I heard you define it. And we've made a commitment that we will follow up. We already have a meeting scheduled with the commissioner of the Department of Correction to talk about transgender incarcerated population. We already have a meeting scheduled with the Secretary of Education to talk about all of those issues surrounding educators and curriculum and pronoun use and why can't I have my chosen name on the attendance? Why does it have to be what's on my birth certificate? So the out panel, just so that they get acknowledgement because they were an inspiration for our youth and what they looked at them and said, you need to get elected to take me out of office. Yeah. You, you need to be the generation coming up. It was Representative Brian Sheena of Burlington, Senator Debbie Ingram, who we've interviewed from Chittenden County, who we've interviewed recently on this show, Senator Becca Ballant, 
of Wyndham County, who will be a soon-to-see interview, Representative Deanna Gonzalez of Winooski, who also is a soon-to-see interview, Representative Matthew Triber of Bellows Falls, Representative Bill Lippert of Hinesburg. Who also will be interviewed. So we be. hope. We're going to be going through the State House with a camera, <laughs> well, shown no mercy. There was one individual who, who was unable to attend, and that was Senator Brian Campion of Bennington County. Our youth that day gave us hope in the sense of this movement is far from over. Yep, mm. and I'm happy. So am I. It's the only thing that's given me a glimmer of hope in this whole year and a half. That well, and dinner at Julio's. I yeah. have, I have <laughs> yes. hopeful international news. Can you court? Nix is for anal exams. I mean, that may not uh, <laughs> speak to our direct condition, but in Kenya, forced anal exams oh. have, have been used routinely. I'd like to show you a picture of Nyeri Gaturu, who is head of legal affairs at the National Gay and Lesbian Human Rights Commission in Kenya, not Kenya's non-governmental LGBT advocacy organization. Um, we are thankful, actually, the Court of Appeals of Kenya ruled that the use of forced anal examinations is unlawful. They've been used by many nations in a mistaken belief that intrusive tests can determine whether a man is homosexual. Uh, Ms. Gachiero says, we are thankful that the appeal court has put Kenyan citizens' rights first. With this ruling, the judges are saying that we all deserve to be treated with dignity and afforded our basic rights as enshrined in the Kenyan constitution. A three-judge panel uh, on March 22nd handed down this ruling. Um, it was a case appealing the state's cruel and degrading treatment of two Kenyan men while under arrest in 2015. They were arrested on suspicion that they were gay. They were subjected to forced anal examinations and HIV testing under a magistrate's court order to determine if they had engaged in consensual sex acts in private. The violating examinations, which include being, lie, being made to lie with legs up in a humiliating position and having instruments forced into their rectum, are widely accepted and have no, to have no medical merit. Um, the, two, the organization representing the two men in the case has long argued that the tests are a violation to privacy and dignity and amount to torture. So thank heavens that was uh, outlawed. Three sh quick uh, positive stories from Australia. Australia. PrEP will be subsidized <laughs> for all people Dick in Australia one. from April 1st. Access to PrEP will finally become cheaper in Australia as the government announces it will subsidize the medication. Having PrEP available at an affordable price through the uh, pharmaceutical benefits scheme uh, is a huge advance, said Daryl O'Donnell, who is um, executive, chief executive of the Australian Federation of AIDS Organizations. This will drive a substantial reduction in transmission and allow us to turbocharge the Australian HIV response. Um, it will cost $30 monthly on this uh, government subsidized program. Imagine what it would cost here. Um, I'm not going there. Really, in the past, people have had to get it from abroad mm -hmm. um, and, um, or join a medical based trial. So, this is a great breakthrough. Tasmania has news. It's made history by electing, electing its first openly lesbian MP. Her name is Allison Standen. We have a picture of her. She was elected last week after standing for a seat. Whilst on the campaign trail, Standen campaigned with her partner and son and often spoke about issues of equality. Tasmania was the last Australian state to get rid of its law criminalizing gay sex and did so two decades ago. Last year, Tasmania introduced legislation to remove historic gay sex convictions from criminal records of LGBT people who have been prosecuted under the previous laws. So 
One more thing from Australia, same-sex couples can now adopt, adopt everywhere in Australia. The Northern Territory passed in the Legislative Assembly on March 13th, um, a law making it the last jurisdiction to reform its adoption law. Anna Brown, Director of Legal a Advocacy, says, the passage of adoption equality will make a significant difference to children who are already being raised in loving homes by same-sex couples. This will finally give them the emotional legal stability that's long been overdue. She continued, now that marriage equality has passed nationally, it's important to bring the laws in every state in line with modern community values and remove every last stain of discrimination against LGBTI people from the statute books across the country. So, uh, I have more good Australia. news. May I share it? Well, I don't know. We're getting a little short here. Go ahead. Is uh, it long? Well, it's about <laughs> Pakistan. I mean, last time I showed you a picture of Pakistan <laughs> trans activists showing their driver's license. But now the Pakistani Senate has voted unanimously in favor of wonderful changes to a transgender rights bill. Um, they can change their gender without approval. Um, Anyone who uh, forces a trans person into illicit intercourse uh, will be punished by uh, prison of 25 years. Rape of transgender people will also come with a death sentence or jail uh, of up to 25 years. A uh, lot of good things coming out of, uh, for trans activists in Pakistan, and I have a picture of them celebrating. All right. So, last week we reported about Starksville, um, Mississippi, having a parade. And um, first they were given a permit, then they was taken away, and then they didn't want to be sued, so they gave the permit back. And anyway, they had the march, and it was the first one ever gay pride march in uh, Starksville, Mississippi. And it was estimated that 2,500 3, people 000. attended. 3, I read 2,500. I read 3,000. Well, all right. We won't argue. It was a big parade. <laughs> Biggest all... one ever in Starksville, right? Yes. yes. The only one ever in Starksville. Oh. So there's been a new policy by Trump which places re severe restrictions on trans people in the military. And as mm -hmm. we have talked about this a lot, trans people... With the history of gender dysphoria, those who require medical treatment are disqualified from military service. Right. A panel came to the conclusion that allowing troops with a history of gender dysphoria represents substantial risk and an unreasonable burden, burden on the military. Persons with gender dysphoria can serve if they have been stable for 36 months. And if they're biological sex and already enrolled and have not had surgery. So um, these are more restrictions. I don't Crazy. know how people can qualify. I guess that's the point, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, it's why it's being challenged and already under appeal. And the appointment of Mike Pompeo. As Secretary of State signals Russia that the U.S. won't condemn its LGBTQ repressive policies. Pompeo has a long record of LGBT actions, including opposing the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, and condemning the Supreme Court's marriage equality decision. And um, a boy in Iowa was told that he couldn't participate in the American Legion boys' state because he is transgender. These are summer leadership programs run by the American Legion. Emmett Cummings, 17, was refused, and the next, this is a really funny part, because the next day after he was refused, his family got an email from the national headquarters that said, the American Legion is exempt from Title IX probation, mm. prohib prohibitions. Mm. So, you know, they didn't waste any time saying, you know, you can't sue me. Covering themselves. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> Oops. And a really story about, um, let 
me see. Where was that? <coughs> oh, one story I really wanted to cover before we move on is um, the religious right is now targeting the Girl Scouts. Um, and, you know, the Girl Scouts are really a different organization than the Boy Scouts since they're, but they're often seen as, ways. but they're often seen as, you know, like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts came, you know, but they're really different. But anyway, um, they're targeting the girls because they aren't being taught to keep their mouths shut, breed babies, and clean house for their men. Kim Davis's lawyers, we remember oh. now. <laughs> they're back. <clears throat> From refusing to give marriage licenses in Kentucky are seething. The lawyers over at Liberty Council are calling for a ban on Girl Scout cookies. So make sure you go out and buy all the Girl Scout cookies you can possibly eat. They are troubled because the Girl Scouts are part of a worldwide organization that promotes abortion and promiscuous sex. Really? So, yes, yes. So. I love Girl Scout cookies. Me too. Thin and it's frozen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so buy all your Girl Scout cookies. Don't forget. And um, we'll move on. <laughs> <laughs> they're still debating the firearms bills. The other things that they are debating, ethnic study standards, H794. This show is like no other we've had before. Um, is going to be taken up by House Education. This is what is going to create the curriculums for our schools, that the people who are being talked about are the people who are going to be creating the curriculum. Racial Oversight Justice Board, this has passed the House. It is now in Senate Judiciary. This would set up a protocol by which we're looking at state government as a whole and ensuring we're doing all the things we really need to do and then there's a, a parentage, H562, that is looking at totally redefining how we identify who are parents. This is being taken up by Senate Judiciary on Wednesday of this week. There's a cluster of bill, minimum wage, paid family leave, and equal pay. They're all that, coming up? that they've all been passed by one chamber, now need to be debated by the other. But these are the three bills that in tandem mm -hmm. will give our community the greatest advancement in achieving economic equality, particularly by virtue of gender. Mm -hmm. And then looking at the equal pay one is where they could not use your employment history against you. You know, most people within our communities are underemployed, underpaid, because we are just looking for employment. Mm -hmm. So if I'm going to try and advance, you can't use what I had to settle for before to try and get forward. And as you heard in my lovely conversation, much to the distraction and annoyance of my co-hosts, what should be following now is an interview with Representative Diana Gonzalez, progressive legislator from Winooski. And we have our trivia. We never said the trivia at I the beginning know, of the- I know, we need to do that. Hi, and we have an interview that we have been waiting for <laughs> with Representative Diana Gonzalez. Progressive of Winooski. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to be here. I, I feel privileged that we get to lure you away from the house and all those firearm people. Yes, well, that was, yeah, so the um, the firearms um, and the, the gun gun bill that we worked on. For 10 hours. For 10 hours. But who's counting? Um, is uh, 14 amendments. 14 amendments, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, it's a really important gun safety bill that yeah. uh, is compatible with the Second Amendment and doesn't take away any gun rights. And uh, being able to thread that needle, I think, is really, really important. Um, and so it's uh, just put a some big common win. sense pieces in place mm -hmm. yep. about purchasing a handgun and yep. the size of magazines mm -hmm. and basically how they get used. Mm -hmm. Yep, so. and um, and that uh, it won't make anybody a criminal who currently has these. So that was a, a big thing. But for, that's for not folks. what I was hearing. So People were going to wake up and right, overnight so they would become right. an outlaw. So that, that's a big part of, of, uh, yeah. of what we passed is that if you currently have magazines that are over 10 rounds, 
they're grandfathered in. Uh, if you are under 21 and currently own a gun, that's fine. Even with the, the new law, if you're under 21, um, between 18 and 21, you can own a gun. It's just the, the purchase that you need to have a fire, um, have a um, hunter safety course to take uh, before you, you do it. So, um, I like that. Yeah, so really very common sense just. that you have some oversight of some adult uh, who's over 21 to be engaged because we know that, that people in that age range really do benefit from um, yeah. community engagement and adult engagement. And so it's these, these small things that can have a big, big Thank impact. Thank you for waiting out the 10 hours and 14 yes, amendments. Yes, and yes, yes. I hope I'm not giving you flashbacks. No, next no it's fine. It, it, sort of moving from that, I mean, what I had said before is you know, what are the things that are going through the legislature right now with which mm -hmm. you're either directly involved or being voted mm -hmm. on by the House that would be of importance or impact to our communities? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, Because people need to remember that the legislators that we're interviewing are our out legislators. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so... We're select. <laughs> <laughs> um, so... Uh, I will I, share my yeah, list. Yes, so you've got right a list, now. which is great. <laughs> um, I think uh, so. In my committee, um, House General Military Affairs, yeah. we uh, picked up minimum wage. Um, the Senate worked on minimum wage for the first half of the session, and then um, now we are picking it up and working on on the House side. And so I think about um, minimum wage, paid family medical leave, and employment history as yes. um, things that. Uh, we worked on in my committee that as economic bills really have big impacts on um, on us as a queer community and and paid family leave you've already voted out of committee voted on successfully in the house yes. and has passed over to the senate exactly so that's in the senate now um and so uh hopefully they'll be working on it and then we'll it'll come back to us with amendments um okay. i'm i'm sure and it's eight weeks of paid family leave was um, the version that came over. Yes. Okay. So, um, yeah, so eight weeks of, of paid family medical leave um, insurance. And so I think that's that's uh, part of what is important <laughs> in my committee. If, if the phone goes off, you put, it, put a little dollar in the, the computer. No, I will have Anne <laughs> throw things at me if I answer this. That's great. Um, uh, so I think whenever we look at... Um, uh, economic development bills and uh, and our human needs yeah. that um, that that it really when we pay, when we acknowledge that we're humans and therefore need human things uh, and build those into yeah. our economic cycle it really benefits all of us particularly those of us who uh, have some systemic dis disadvantage yeah. so um, when we such as being a member of our such as being a member of our community, so being part of the LGBTQ community really um, does put us at an economic disadvantage in lots of different ways. And uh, when we have paid family medical leave insurance, it maintains our involvement in the workforce, and it keeps us connected. And what we know from the research is that when we keep connected to a job, we are more likely to be able to retain that job, more likely to, re to return to that job. Bingo. And, um, and the employer really benefits absolutely. by that because yep. they're not losing you right. as a skilled employee. Yes. As a, as it's You're already trained, back. as already onboarded. Um, uh, so it, we, the, the hidden cost of business, there's, one of the big hidden costs of businesses is, is tur employee turnover. Yeah. And it's not something that businesses quantify easily, and so uh, it's something that doesn't really get seen, which really ties into minimum wage because low-wage workers... And it's minimum wage, not necessarily livable wage. Correct. Because we're still working on that we're one. We're still working on that okay. one. Yeah, so, so um, uh, livable wage in Vermont right now for um, two... Uh, Two partnered adults who live together mm -hmm. is thirteen dollars an hour. Okay. Um, and we're looking. The minimum wage is looking at fifteen dollars an hour by two thousand twenty-four. Yep, twenty twenty-four. Yep. Um, and so um, that that livable wage is with um, with no ch no children, yeah. um, and assuming no debt, assuming no vacations, um, assuming no savings. And so, even, assuming you can find affordable housing, <laughs> uh, um, and there's so there's lots of there's there's a base formula that was originally used uh, for the livable wage and has been built on because right. it's necessary to maintain 
the same assumptions in order to have uh, comparable data across time. And that um, those assumptions are still very bare bones and uh, looking at the consumer debt that we have and the um, student loan debt that we have as, as, a, as a culture, um, that is really not even realistic to, to, to And $15 an hour in 2024, given rate of inflation, mm -hmm. adjusting the scale, is going to be still under that it, livable it wage. It still is under that livable wage for, um, two, for two adults with no children. Yeah. The, the other bills that you've been working on that you know, really get my attention mm -hmm. is like the response to systemic racism. Mm -hmm. And I know mm -hmm. that the Senate version of the Debbie Ingram had mm -hmm. sponsored, came out of their committee, and mm -hmm. it has now come over yep. to you all. Mm -hmm. And there have been some modifications mm -hmm. on it. What was, when you helped to draft and introduce this, mm -hmm. what were you looking at it doing? I mean, because last year there was a lot that was restorative justice, fair and impartial policing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. sort of, how does this fill in the blanks? Yeah, so Act 54 that, uh, that came out last year, it, mm -hmm. that bill started out looking at all aspects of life. So it started out looking at our healthcare system, our education system, our judicial system, our criminal justice system. Um, and so it it started out that way and as legislation happens um, it goes through it morphs it it comes out in in a different different yeah. spot than it starts and so what came out of act 54 was looking at uh, systemic racism in and racial disparities in mm -hmm. our ju judicial system and our policing okay. and particularly with some juvenile aspects looking at it um, that was the main part of it there was a sub part of it that had um, a group of folks uh, in the government putting for, forward recommendations of how to look at these other aspects of life, how to look at these other aspects of our government, and um, came up with some recommendations from that. So part of that, is, um, part of those recommendations were how to support our government systems to collect the data around our racial disparities. For, for the or, rest, from the rest of our for, lives. From the rest of our <laughs> lives, right? So collect, so collect data from the rest of our lives. Um, and then what to do about it. Yeah. Um, and so the, um, and so that was the impetus for us out in the House to create another bill to, to, um, to join those recommendations um, that, that came out from that small group of folks. Because uh, at the time of putting that legislation, the, the, um, the full uh, report, there was two reports from two different groups of people coming out of um, Act 54. And right. so the, the um, smaller governmental report, the smaller group of people with the um, recommendations um, from that, um, that came out earlier and earlier enough for us to craft legislation. So that's what came out for that. Um, that was the impetus for us in the House. Um, and uh, I believe from um, Senator Ingram as well on, right. on the Senate I think they side. were mirror bills. They were, they were very much. similar. Yeah, they were, there were some differences, but they were similar content based upon that, that report. And so, um, now, what the Senate came out with was um, really creating a position, a within, position the within, within the administration. And so looking at, um, you know, other states have things like a civil rights officer or an equal opportunity affirmative action officer. Right. Uh, Vermont has a, currently has a structure of human rights commission for all state government areas and civil rights division at the attorney general's office for all other aspects. And both of those are complaint driven. And so having That's a, not proactive. So having a, um, a position and that uh, can be proactive, that can work more. Pull all the data, pull all the in. data in. This is what it means. Mm -hmm. This is how we can move forward. Yep. This is how we can respond to this yep. in a manner that exactly. sort of mitigates that. Yep. The other piece sort of flowing into that was the ethnic studies standards curriculum mm -hmm. that you're a co-sponsor mm -hmm. on. D let me tell you, when I first read this, I yep. get very excited mm -hmm. because if I'm looking at it correctly, this is the first time we're really saying you really do need to teach on these issues, mm -hmm. but the people for the people for whom you were teaching about mm -hmm. need to be included in creating mm -hmm. that curriculum yeah. so it's an accurate portrayal mm -hmm. of who they are. Mm -hmm. So yeah. So how did you become involved with this? What were you, 
I've told you what I'm hoping it's going to do. What what did you really hope it was going to do? Yeah, so so this bill um, really is um, Representative Morris's bill uh, that I have joined with her on it. Kaya and, is um, just kicking on this she, one. She just is. And so she um, worked with a, um, and is continuing to work with a, um, a huge cohort of, of advocates on this uh, yeah. to, um, to uh, create a bill that is useful um, for our, our education system. And um, personally, I was an ethnic studies major in college. And, um, uh, like going home and, again. <laughs> and, and really, the, the research on the, place, the states that do have ethnic studies are very clear that it increases graduation rates and success in school. And um, it's all of these wonderful things. And I think part of sometimes that gets missed when you talk about ethnic studies is how really looking at the development of different uh, ethnic groups that are now considered white and how um, that examination of the development of whiteness and looking at it through an ethnic lens is really helpful for students, particularly white students that come from poverty, yeah. because so much has gotten lost in terms of ethnic pride and connection I, of the contribution when you uh, have generations of poverty, that that just you know, strips, strips so much from us. Um, and so having a focus on the, um, the richness of background of, of a variety of ethnic groups it is so helpful for students um, across the color lines. And one of the reasons this was exciting was you know, looking at the LGBTQ youth leadership Mm -hmm. day that happened at the State House, some of the things that our youth were bringing up was they were learning about being LGBTQ out of their health care curriculum if it was being offered, but it was predominantly by this well-meaning, cisgendered, mm -hmm. straight instructor, mm -hmm. and why were they being relegated to the internet to really get their right. information about self-identity. Yep. You were part mm -hmm. of the out legislator mm -hmm. panel for yep. that day mm -hmm. in our last three and a half minutes. <laughs> well, that just, that because just we have the clock that Look Zach at that. put up clock. for us. Perfect. You were part of it. Yep. What was your impression of our youth the day, the questions they had to ask of you? I mean, just so fantastic. I mean, it really is. 65 uh, of them. 65, just huge. I mean, I. I shared this with them that day, and, and I think about it, but my, my high school, there was 2,400 students in the high yeah. school, and there was one person that was out. Um, not, <laughs> not me, I was not, I was not that person. Um, and uh, a friend of mine who's, um, who had an uncle who was out, and yeah. that, uh, you know, having an adult in his life. And when I was in high school, I didn't know that I knew gay adults. Um, I, I know that now I, now I know that I did, um, but at the time I didn't know any. Um, I didn't know that I knew any any gay adults, and so um, being able to uh, be in the sea of youth who are really uh, exploring who they are, claiming who they are, building community, organizing, having really good policy questions. I mean, it just just was so wonderful. I mean, you you had already left when the governor was there with mm -hmm. them and really didn't have answers because mm -hmm. some of the questions they had were not necessarily things he had thought about. Yep. So he looked at them and said, you know, what is it that I should know? Yep. What is it I should do? And I was listening to our youth and thinking, when I was 16, I couldn't have engaged in that thought process mm -hmm. to give that answer. Mm -hmm. you know, they seemed much more engaged and knowledgeable mm -hmm. than I was at that time. Mm -hmm. Which shows how old I am. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think there's I think there's lots of different changes in what people are able what what young people particularly are able to access. And um, I uh, was reading about Emma Gonzalez, the um, activist from Florida. I and, tell everyone she's your uh, niece, just so you know. <laughs> so so you know Gonzalez you is, a, is a colonial <laughs> is a colonial name. It's we can talk about kind of why there's so many of us that have that last name, but um, but. Uh, so she's she's, the, she, she's the president of her Gay Straight Alliance at her high school. Her six minutes of absolute silence yeah. on the mall was staggering. Staggering. So in our last minute, mm -hmm. you have to come back. Yes. We'll yes, do please. better at organizing right. this time. Yes, yes, I'll, yes. I'll, I'll track what's being debated. <laughs> Anything that we haven't talked about? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's Indigenous Peoples Day that yep. comes up every year. 
Mm -hmm. The governor issues a proclamation. I'm not sure why it simply hasn't happened, mm -hmm. but and then you've got the prevention of sexual harassment, mm -hmm. which of course in 30 seconds, <laughs> seconds you can tell everything we need to know. Basically this says an employer has to put in place and cannot inhibit an individual's right to report sexual harassment were it to occur in the workplace. Um, it I wouldn't characterize it as, like that, okay. and I think that in our maybe 10 seconds, we don't quite have time to okay. characterize it, but um, but it, it puts in some very helpful provisions for employers to be able to follow the law, okay. because it's... Um, uh, That's what I meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because employers don't always have access to what they need in order to, to follow existing law, and so um, it's it's helpful in that way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, were, you so you much. You were worth the wait, <laughs> and you will come back. Yes, absolutely. Thank, thank you. you. This was the first elected person of color to the Vermont legislature. Vermont. Yes. Mm. Shirley Chisholm. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm guessing. No idea. <laughs> Shirley snuck into Vermont? <laughs> Actually, when I went to do research, it was very interesting. This is the answer to the trivia question. It was in 1836 from Brownington, Vermont, which is Orleans County. It was Alexander Lucius Twilight who was the first person of color elected to a state legislature in the U.S. Really? However... The first woman of color wasn't until 1990. Well, that doesn't surprise me. And it was Lavinia Bright from South Burlington, which was also the year of the first openly gay man to be elected to the legislature, which was Ron Squires. But the first lesbian wasn't elected until 2008, and it's someone you both know, and one of you may have interviewed. Uh-huh. Oh, <gasps> Chris, no, not Christine. <laughs> Christine is not a le has never been a legislator. <laughs> oh, <laughs> of course. Racial justice. Yes, of course. Susie Wurzawadi. Bingo. <laughs> there we go. Thank you for spending this time with us. We'll see you again in two weeks. And as Linda says, resist. resist.